But there's something about the body of Christ so wonderful. There's something about the meeting place, the church place, that the Holy Spirit does things that he won't do and can't do any other place. There's a connection that has to happen between people. And, uh, you know, we live in a time now where more people interact um, uh, with the world around them in an isolated, you know, virtual reality on the Internet or whatever else. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. And, it's in, and what God's called us to be is a community. He's called us to be a big, happy family. He's called, called us to come to a place where we honor our parents. We honor the authorities that the Lord placed in our life so that we can profit from that kind of community, that kind of family, that kind of interaction. And we live in a rebellious age that doesn't allow that. We live in a modern time that really wants to have it another way. They want to despise authorities. And that's part of the last days, to despise authorities and to not listen to those who have uh, that place uh, to speak into your life. And, and as, as the Word of God says, has the rule over you. And when, when you're not willing to participate and when you're not willing to do that, you're actually isolating yourself from those things that otherwise you would easily receive from God because the school of the Spirit, where the Holy Spirit is the ruler and the authority in your life, ultimately is a, is a interaction, a relationship that has every dimension of the value and importance of honoring authority of those uh, of those long-lasting covenant relationships, all of the elements of love and humility and servitude, all of the elements of meekness and, um, and, and just covenant as a whole is there. What if you don't want to, what if you don't want to participate? Well, the Lord says like this. He said, how can you say you love your God whom you haven't seen when you hate your brother whom you have? And he really does break it down that in, in, in large part, our relationship with Tim has for a basis of that relationship, our relationship with one another. Now, people would try to say, well, you know, from a semantics point of view, it's not that I, that I don't love them and it's certainly I don't hate them, you know. It's just that I don't like them. Right? You heard that, right? Well, such a thing doesn't exist in the Bible. It's like saying it. Neither he nor she, but it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Not in the Hebrew language. This it is there is there a neuter in Arabic? Or is there is there a neuter in Arabic? Yeah. Most Middle Eastern languages I, I think in Farsi no, there's no neuter. You have to go to Greek. You have to go to Greece and get into Greek language, a Hellenistic realm mindset, from which there are a lot of languages are a derivative of that, to get an it, to get a like. Reality just doesn't exist. It's like, it's, 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 it's dark, or it's light, right? It's night, or it's day. Not, it's not a, a um, you know, and not a mixture of the two. It just doesn't exist. So the, and these are fundamental things. These are fundamental rules. You want to learn how to walk in the Spirit. The Holy Ghost is not. He, he's not going to mix it up with a lie. He, he's a spirit of truth. He will not mix with a lie. That's a, probably the hardest thing for people to get. We want the Holy Spirit to come and mix with our falsehood. Our imagination, our make-believe, our ethical, you know, uh, ethical normalization of things, situational ethics as well. We want him to mix with that. We want him to mix with everything we can imagine of ourselves. He's not going to do that. He's looking for you and I to come to school and say that God's word is absolutely better than ours. That God's way is better than our way. That the Lord knows how this, how life is supposed to work, and we're willing to cooperate with Him and play by His rules and do it His way. Pretty radical, huh? First step, first step. And 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 I and then I would come to the point of of saying that I have watched again and again where 
many of God's people, they don't want to take the first step. And then they want to come and they want to talk to me in a counseling room or offline in a counseling room about how it's not working out for them and how, why is it that they can't get a breakthrough and and I think all the time when people are saying that, I'm thinking, weren't you in church? I mean, I've been repeating myself for 30 years. Uh, I feel like every time I stop, start to step out beyond uh, just a repeat of the sermon that I preached last time, that the Lord is saying, no, 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 don't do that. You've got to do step number one first. Everybody was, no, I don't want to do step one, two, and three. I want to get all the way on the platform. No, 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 no. Step one, step two, step three, step four. And I'm not espousing, you know, a 12-step program or a step of any sort program. I'm just saying that the Lord lays, there's, you've got to take the first step before you take the second step. That's all I'm saying. Okay, and, 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 and we want to, ultimately, we want to create a little bit of God. Well, I really like this, all these things that the Lord is saying, but, and, and, and I, I really like a lot of this of what the preacher is saying, but, you know, I also believe it needs to be this way as well. But you're, when you bring this way as well in, it's not even in the Bible. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the classic situation of arguing with God from silence. And that's the, in other words, the Bible didn't speak it, right? I was just, you know, talking to my friends here on the front row, and they were asking me about a, a, a very uh, elusive verse of Scripture in the Bible, and they said, well, who is this person? I said, well, um, and, and they said, well, so-and-so said it was this person. I said, well, reality of it is, the Bible defines the framework to tell us who this person is. And if we say it's anyone else, then we're arguing from silence because we would rather go with the imaginative um, concept of an elusive scripture than what we already know, the given factors of it, okay? We do that in so many different areas of life. And so now you're wondering what we're talking about. And we're talking about the young man who was, had, you know, who was, uh, you know, had basically his cloak taken off of him and he ran away naked, right? And some people say this one and it's that one and it's the other person. Well, it could have been this one and that one and the other person because from the Bible we understand that Jesus was with his 12 apostles and that's all. We know of no one else there. And at that moment in time, those would have been the only ones there that were part of Jesus' community. So, and then we can then bring other elements into that to help us understand who that is. But, you know... Um, what we do is we take a lot of personal opinions and personal beliefs and personal ideas and personal wishes and personal ambitions and personal wants and we try to integrate the Bible into that. We try to get Father to agree with that. We hopefully somehow get the Holy Spirit to come on board through some persuasive argument. But maybe we don't even go that far. Maybe we don't even talk to the Holy Spirit and say, well, Holy Spirit, I know that, that this isn't in the, tr the Word of God and it's not the truth of the Word of God and that I do recognize that you don't do anything other than truth and that really all that you're going to be doing in my life is already described by the Word of God, but I would like to convince you that you should also allow me to do these other things. <laughs> and if we went through all of that, Perhaps we would stop midstream and go, I really shouldn't be trying to convince God that what I want is something he should approve of. I should be rather about the process of coming to learn what it is he knows. Because he already knows everything I know. And I don't know even a fraction of what he knows. But he's come here to show me everything that he knows. Why should I be preoccupied with the nonsense that I know when he's come to show me everything that he knows? I mean, come, come, please, somebody get logical for just a few minutes. He's come to take everything that belongs to God, everything that belongs to the, the, the immense and, and, and infinite and eternal knowledge of God and reveal it to us. And we're busy. We're busy with what? Laundry. Mowing the yard. Dishes. Whatever. I'm, I'm trying to... Trying to reduce this to the insanity that we have ultimately valued, you know, our lives 
And the, the basis by which we have somehow processed and said, this is so much more important for me to do. And, you know, and it kind of, kind of comes back to the classic situation on Martha and Mary and, and, you know, make her get up and help me. I'm trying to fix some food for us to eat around here. No, 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 no I'm not. No, I don't want to. I don't, basically, she said, I don't care about the food. She's chosen the better thing. Why don't you get over here and sit down? Why don't you rather join us? Huh? And he didn't say that. She's chosen the better part. You busy. You busy. And was it good things that she's busy about? Was it was it honorable? Sure, but it ain't. It wasn't important. It didn't make the difference of the day. Really, not for Jesus. It would have made the difference of her day. So I'm here to talk to you about discernment. I'm, there are so many people that need to be here tonight. I have pastored for 30 years. I for actually thir- I pastored a little longer than 30 years, but I pastored what we call the Abiding Place Ministry for 30 years. And pastored before that, before I started this church. And, and of course, I didn't start it by myself. I started in conjunction with my dad and, and ministry that was around me at the time. And, um, you know, before that, I, 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 was, I, I was raised in the church and, and, and um, you know, with my mother, around uh, she's she's with the lord right now but she was like you're gonna learn the bible and you're gonna learn it now and you're gonna be happy about it and that's the way i grew up so i knew the word of god very well by the time i was 12 years old and it was uh it was bible reading and prayer for every meal and serious bible reading before we went to bed whether you like it or not you're gonna stay awake you go sleep afterwards and so that's, you know, I, I knew all the Bible stories. I knew all the Bible stories very, very well by the time I was six, seven years old. And, uh, and I say that just to tell you my background. You know, just say, I, I mean, my dad was a revivalist and I was in church after church after church. And one of the things we're always puzzled about by is why don't God's people get it? Why don't they understand that that is the voice of demonic power that they're listening to? Why? And, and I, I, don't, I don't, not only heard that in my house around all the preachers that sat around our dinner table, but I heard it everywhere else I would go. I would hear preachers and pastors and evangelists and other ministers lamenting. Why don't God's people get it? This is not difficult. Why do they listen to the voice of a demonic realm that makes them sad, discouraged, disappointed, overwhelmed, feel like running away? Why don't they get that the Holy Ghost is a minister ministering comfort, peace, Confidence, certainty, boldness. We're going to get this thing done. Do some more afterwards. You know, why don't they get it? Why is it that that God's people have no ability to stand against the repercussions of Satan? If they go out on the streets to evangelize, we watched it over and again. They're fine. They're good. They're doing well. They're finally got a smile on their face. They're finally lifting their hands just a little bit. I mean, it's like you know, it's a little bit of a breakthrough about right here. Just kind of like, you know, it's, a, it's, 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 that, it's that envelope where everything starts shaking, about to break down. So you got to come back off the envelope. You know what I'm saying? But, they, you know, they finally got a smile on hands about, you know, half mass. And now you're going to get them to go out on the street. And they go out on the street. And if you do that, they don't have the ability to stand against the repercussions of Satan. Because he gets up and face, you in my territory. And he says it in unique ways. That makes people feel like their life is devastated and things are falling apart. And, you know, being overwhelmed and no one loves them. No one likes them. They're going to the wrong church now for sure. <laughs> we watch it open again. Why is it? Why is the condition of the church the way it is right now when God describes in his word a total, completely distinct reality 
that anybody with any sense of education and ability to read and, and, and reading comprehension are going to say, this that's being described right here is very different than what we're seeing right now. And then in that mix and in that melu of things, here you've got this. It's like the children of Israel walking around the wilderness. Instead of we walking around the wilderness, we walking around the church. We're going from this church to that church to this church to that church and back to the We're going to backside for a while and come back to this church or go to that other church. And that's it. Never satisfied. Wanderers, wandering stars, wandering true God's church God's family God's house it's my goodness gracious you can't divorce the people that you know in the kingdom of God anymore you can divorce your mama <laughs> you're going to find out sooner or later but if those things aren't established in your heart fundamentally you're dealing with falsehoods you're, 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 you're being led and influenced by things that have nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. And every time you step out and you're influenced by other things, the spirit of a lie and deception and illusion, you aren't able to hear the voice of the Holy Ghost. And so discernment, there is no discernment among God's people. You can hear the prophets of old lamenting. There is no discernment among God's people. Solomon wasn't an idiot. Okay, he was he was a very good genetics, a very good lineage. He was a smart guy that who from a very young age was being educated and skilled in the best of the best that was available in Israel because his dad was not only king, his dad was rich. And not only was he king and not only was rich, everybody had to obey him. And so, therefore, he found the best tutors that he could find for his son, Solomon, whom God had revealed to him would be king. <laughs> right? Getting him ready to lead God's people. And now Solomon is so ready to lead God's people. He's so equipped. He's so prepared. He's so bested. His father bested him with riches and bested him with wealth and bested him with authority and bested him with great counselors all around him and mighty men around him. And he steps up on the scene and he says, Father, I do not know how to come in or go out. I do not know how to discern between good and evil. How can I lead this people? Come on, man. Somebody's got a hold of reality. That all your academics and all your education and all your insight and all your understanding and all of your knowledge will get you nowhere. You can't do anything. But yet, 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 we don't get that because we lack knowledge. <laughs> Huh? We act like the knowledge of God. We act understanding, huh? which sees the whole picture put together. After that, you have the knowledge of God. We lack wisdom, which gives us the divine insight. And God, the Holy Spirit, said, I'm here for you. I want to show you I am the spirit of wisdom. I am the spirit of knowledge. I am the spirit of understanding. I am the spirit of counsel. I am the spirit of might. I am the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I have understanding. I have counsel. I have strength. When you go and you start reading through Proverbs, I mean, I, I pray that you'll understand that if you, want to come into un, if you want to come into discernment, the discerning of spirits is my goal to take you. I want to take you to discerning of spirits. You will not be able to discern spirits until you're able to stop listening to and responding to voices of darkness. Because they were not identified. Because they were not identified. Because I'm talking about things that make you sad, things that make you feel bad about yourself, things that make you feel like a failure, things that make you feel like discouraged, disappointed, everything that belongs to sadness, mourning, everything that belongs to strife, envy, criticism, all that stuff is from a demonic realm. And too many people do not identify it. 
I was sitting in church on Wednesday night. I'm preaching something that is so key to stepping over into the realms of divine glory. And there is all of this opposition coming at me saying, ain't nobody ready for this. They just want you to tell them how good they are and how good they're doing now. Hey, look, kindergarten's over. Oh, I'm going to go, nursery's done. We out of nursery now. And anybody that's this age that wants to go back to nursery and be cuddled, you got a problem. <laughs> it's those days are over. Yeah. Praise God. I would never want to be, I, I want nobody cuddling me. You know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, need, I don't need the crackers. And, so I, we have an age. We have an age now where everybody really, you can see what people want. They flock to it by the masses. Go and look. You can see what they want. They're, they're, they're there. They're showing up by the 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. And someone just tells them, oh, you can, you, you're just doing so good. And, and it's all working out just perfectly for you. And we should all be so happy because we got, got so much and we're doing so well. No, we're not. It's time out. What planet are you on? What, what is your standard of truth? Where are you coming from? Is your standard of truth the word of God? Is what you want the will of the Father? Is the known will of the Father? Are you telling me now that you're saying we're doing so well because you've evaluated the will of the Father and the standard of God and we are a superimposable action of that activity? No, <laughs> because then you're looking at the fullness of the measure of the maturity of the ministry of Jesus. Then you're looking at everybody happy, full of the Holy Ghost, everybody prophesying. I know what's going on right now, right now, at this moment in time. These are the last days. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and ye shall prophesy. And if there's anything that describes the company of God's people in the church is the prophetic anointing upon every man. Where it's fundamentally expressed as you're worshiping and praising the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all that's within you. And they're touching heaven and being filled. And as you're filled, now more comes out of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How is it then, brethren, that when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm. That's a prophetic song. A psalm, a prophetic song, not Psalms 100. Make joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye, all ye lands. I mean, that's a good one, but you know, but that's not what we're talking about. It's good, it's good, but that's not what he said. How is it that every one of you hath a psalm? 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Every one of you hath a revelation. Huh? Then it's something about your cat or your dog or your house or your car or, or, or your vacation or what you're going to do and, and when you get a promotion. It's a revelation of who Jesus is and what God's plan for us and what the next move is and what the next event in the kingdom of God is and the sign of the one of the miracles that God wants to do. Yeah. We're too busy, too occupied with a bunch of nonsense. That's why people are so sad. They're not filled. Get filled is different. Are you with me? Yes. How many think that I don't believe this? <laughs> I believe this. It's in some little story for me to tell, some little meeting for me to have. I'm passionate about these things. Yeah, these are, this, is more, this is more real to me than, than life is. These, these things have gone. These things, aren't just, these things aren't just possibilities, they're realities. And, and the reality of it is, is we're not willing to step into God's reality. We want God to step into ours, and he's not. He will not. Papa will not. It's the first thing you're going to have to come to terms with. Huh? Jesus is not coming down to walk with you. He has called you up to come live with him. Huh? He has called you up. Come. He said, come dwell with me. Come abide with me. Come dwell with me. Come up here. If any man dwells in me, just like a branch dwells in the vine. Branches don't walk around going, hey, vine, any vine out of here want me? I'm looking for a vine. The vine produces the branch. The branch is happy to dwell there. I'm looking for a, I'm looking for a place to fit in. Give me a break. God made you fit when he made you a new creation. It's just that you want and we want to 
I don't want to, but it seems like the, the mass, of, mass of people want to go do something other than what Jesus is doing. Wants to do something other than what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's come to show us what is impossible for anybody to see, to know, to understand, to think, to reason. He's come to show us what eyes never seen, ears never heard, never has it entered into the heart of men. Those things which God has prepared for them that love Him. But He has now revealed them to us by His Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who's come with all the truth that belongs to heaven. Mm. People, you just got to realize when, when, we, when we begin to step out and do the things that belong to the kingdom of God, the repercussions against that, against the truth. Satan hates the anointing, he hates the word. Satan hates God. He hates Jesus Christ. He hates the Holy Spirit. He hates anyone who's going to bring that powerful, mighty, wonder-working power of the name of Jesus. And he will do. He knows you. He knows your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather, all your grandmothers. He knows every brother, every sister, every aunt, every uncle, every family member. All, all, he knows everything about you. He knows your weaknesses, every dimension of your life. Huh? He knows where you've opened up the door and allowed Satan in. He knows where you've listened and come under his influence. He just basically goes right there. And he sticks his finger right in it and says, you're going to obey me. You're going to listen to me. We want you to be able to have the ability to discern good and evil. Amen. I'm going to read a verse of scripture to you here in uh, Hebrews. Let me get my Bible so everybody knows I'm reading the Bible. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, uh, forgive me, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. I had some preachers one day. I was standing in a meeting in a, in a, in a, in a uh, <laughs> pastor's conference. And I was, quote, I mean, the power and the anointing of God was so strong on me. Because I had to have, because the opposition was amazing. See, opposition against the truth, against me, in foreign em environments, had no impact on me. Whether it's church, doesn't matter. No impact on me. In my own church, where people are supposed to be submitted and connected to God, it's the same as resisting and saying no to the Holy Ghost. Shuts everything down. Then I've got a battle to speak even a single word. And people, if they could just realize they're not fighting against men, they're not resisting men, they're not arguing with men. People can argue really loud silently. Right? Silent disapproval. Silent disagreement. This is against God the Holy Ghost. How are you ever going to be taught by Him? How are you going to ever welcome Him who is so gentle, who's so sweet, who's so unimposing? He would be like a dove. Huh? How are you going to walk around with a dove on your shoulder? Very carefully. Huh? Are you with me? He's that way. He's so gentle. Huh? He's not going, and then put into that, put in combination, he's not ever mixing, with, he's so sacred, he's never mixing with nothing profane. And then he's not mixing with any falsehood, no lie, he's not mixing with sadness, he's not going to be there. God, the Holy Ghost, will not be there in your sadness. Or in your sorrow, he will not mix with it, he will not find any of his influence there, none. He will call you out into the joy. He call you out. You said in the sorrow and sadness, you in the darkness. People go, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going back over there no more. He he said God wasn't gonna be with me when I'm sad. Hey, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna say it again. God's gonna be with you there. He, he's gonna be with you. He's not gonna be mixed up with you. He's gonna call you out of your sadness and your sorrow. <laughs> he just said, come on over here into the joy. You make a choice. I'm gonna sit over here in my sorrow and my sadness, or I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna move over there into that joy. People always ask me, what do I got to do to step into this realm of divine power where everyone hath a psalm and everyone hath a revelation, everyone hath a doctrine, everyone hath a tongue, everyone has an interpretation. Go read it for yourself. That's the church. You want to know what church I'm looking for? You know what church I want to be a part of? The one that Jesus described. The one God, the Holy Ghost, did everywhere Paul went. And so he described it. And he took an example of one of the worst churches he could find. One of, the, one of the weakest churches he could find is to go, let's, let's just use Corinthian. Church over there at Corinthian as a model. Huh? And they had it going on, man. The manifestation of the Spirit was happening in every person's life there. 
Praise God. Don't you want it? Don't you want that? I know you do. You wouldn't be here. There are a lot of people that are not here tonight because they cannot distinguish between the accusing voice of Satan that creates discouragement and disappointment and defeat and a sense of failure and I'm not good enough or all the other nonsense. Oh, I don't want to hear him scream at me again. And call me over here into the joy. I want you to... I want to hear somebody tell me to get up, start advancing the kingdom. I want somebody to get up here and baby powder my pew for me because things are a little uncomfortable. It needs to be softer. No, no, no. God's called us to be soldiers who endure hardness, who will do anything for him. Hallelujah. Who will go through the sufferings of things that will be imposed upon us, but with exceeding joy. Hallelujah. The conclusion of your life. If, it, if you don't get it before, I hope you get it just before you breathe out your last breath. God says rejoice evermore. What a life to live. This is, where, this is fundamentally how you step in and start hooking up with the Holy Ghost and being taught of Him. We want God to teach us, oh God, I'm up here and I just so, feel so terrible. I'm such a failure and I, oh, I just don't like myself and I'm just messing up all the time. It doesn't seem like I'm getting anywhere and I'm working so hard. He's like, call me when you want me to come back. <laughs> you have to do that one on your own. Papa's not going to do that, not have the conversation, because that's falsehood. Huh? People come in, sit in my office, they want me to have that conversation with them. I'm going to imitate Jesus. I'm going to say, that's a lie. People come in and say, listen, I got this problem. You do? What is it? Well, I got this. I said, that's a lie. It is? Yeah, it is. Then they say, well, I got this other problem. Oh, that's a lie, too. <laughs> well, where are we getting here? Well, well, let me tell you about what this other thing is going on. Oh, that's another lie. It's all lies. It's time you start getting hold of the truth. What you're doing is you're engaged with your life in this world. And you're struggling with the adversity and the problems of your own will. Father says, leave that. Come over here into this life that I have for you and live by my will. And everything changes. Hallelujah. Now you want to live in church. Now you want to bring your sleeping bag. Amen. And you move right on in. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. How many more meetings are we going to have today? Well, we necessarily only have in one today. No, you've got to be kidding me. Um, I'm in China. And then, you know, and we've been going, Ann and I were going at it hard every day, just every single day. We were in a basement because it was a full lockdown, high security area. Everybody in there was going to go to prison if they were caught again. They'd be going because they'd been to prison before. And we'd been, we'd been ministering for at least three or four days and had been ministering, I don't know, 10, 14, 10 to 14 hours because nobody wants to leave. And so that morning, I, it was about 11 o'clock, and, you know, they started at 5 in the morning. And I told them I just wouldn't be able to operate if I got up at 5. But I'd meet them down there at 7. <laughs> they started at 5 in prayer because they get up and pray 5 in the morning, 5 every morning. The whole... The whole of China, the Church of China does, is as I understand it. That's what's been told to me. And um, so I get down there at 7, they've all been praying. And so I, I said, you know, it's like about 11 o'clock or something like that. And I was going wide open, 7 11, just going at it. This signs, wonders, miracles, we're going to do this thing. God's appointed you, you are anointed to do it, you sold every, you, you're sold out, you can be in expectation of this. I said, you know what, we're just going to go ahead and break a little bit early here today because I was thirsty and I was also hungry. I said, and, and, and then, you know, what, we can meet back. What, what, and I looked over to the pastors and well, there were several pastors said, like, what, we meet back at one. And then all of them said, well, we, we're just going to stay here until you come back because the presence of God is just too precious for us to leave. I'm like, am I still on earth or am I, on, am, am, am I in heaven? <laughs> Huh? I mean, I walked out of there, but I'll tell you right now, I got, I got myself back in there next 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, no way. No, I'm not, no, not going to be the outlier around here. I mean, we might be hit, you know, right? 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 Are you with me? 
<laughs> a one-eyed man is a hero among the blind, but he's a casualty among the seeing. <laughs> I'm not going to be a casualty. I just because I might have a great hunger in America. I'm over here now. I look like the person who just really am very passionate for the Lord. Ain't going to be me. I'm going to step it up. It's time to step it up. We're going to walk in there into another realm of consecration to the Lord. Praise God. <laughs> And look, I mean, the Lord is just calling. He's calling us into a place to where that we love him. And I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not legally bound. I'm not under some tyrannical dictatorship. I'm not legally bound. I want to be. I want to be here. I, I, want, I want to be here. I, 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 want, I want to be here. Even if I was with the frozen chosen, I would want to be here because it's the house of the Lord. I was telling some people the other day or today, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm telling people this probably every day. But it doesn't matter where I'm at. I just worship the Lord with all my heart and forget that anybody else is there. I mean, we were talking about, we were talking about chapel at, at Point Loma Nazarene College. I went to chapel all the time. I love chapel. And I know that I mean, it was a little bit obnoxious because I could, everybody could hear me singing. <laughs> because I didn't care what they were doing. They had, that song had Jesus in it. And he's, my, he's all my heart's desire. And then they're just showing up because you got to go to every chapel, you know, twice a week, uh, three times a week. Otherwise, you can get in trouble and get kicked out potentially out of school. I'm there because I'm going to Jesus. Are you here? You have to deal with that because it's, rela- it's fundamental relationship issues. That your problem is never with somebody else. It's between you and Jesus. And when you get that wisdom, when you get that insight, you're going to start moving forward in your life. You're going to begin to understand how to walk in the Holy Ghost. You're going to begin to get some discernment about you, discernment about the choices that you make. Solomon says, I don't know how to choose. I don't know how to determine good for me. I don't know how to come in and out. God said, okay, listen to me. Listen to me now. You didn't ask for wealth. And you didn't ask for power over other nations. I'm going to give you spirit of wisdom. I'm called my wisdom come upon you. And then James says to us, any man lack wisdom? Ask Papa. He gives liberally. Generously. He doesn't withhold from anybody. Somebody tell me, the church comes with these indications that God's withholding. You're withholding. You're withholding. I was talking to a person the other day. He said, well, I wish God would wake up. I just started laughing. He wishes you would wake up. You don't want to need to wake up. Hello, I'm going to be the voice of reason here. I'm going to shout out and say, things ain't right. It ain't right. And I'm not going to use subjective reasoning or ideas of my own. I'm going to say, here's what the Bible said. Look at Jesus dressed in all his glory. He says, that's who we are supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to look like and act like. Come on now. Amen. Amen. The, the, the challenge is, is why do I feel bad? I don't know, but you need to stand up and rebuke it right now in Jesus' name. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Because the word of God already told me I'm supposed to be feeling good. Yeah. For the fruits of the Spirit is, is feeling good. That's what it said. That's what Scripture says. The fruits of the Spirit are in all goodness. Yes. Now, if they ain't feeling good, I don't know what is. <laughs> Uh, it's goodness apart from feeling. Oh, it ain't about feelings. Oh, yes, it is. Love is a feeling. Joy is a feeling. Goodness is a feeling. Peace is a feeling. Patience is a feeling. When's the last time you didn't feel patience? Or be- rather, should I say, feel impatience? It troubled your whole soul. It touched your, the hair on the back of your neck that you can't even grab a hold of with your fingers. It will. Impatience. When are you supposed to allow fear? When are you supposed to allow discouragement? When are you supposed to allow things coming out of your mouth that are evil? That are evil on the, on the level of saying, I'm not important. That's evil. It's contrary to the word of God. You are important. I don't have the, wait, wait, what, what are you talking about? I just can't feel joy. I just can't feel peace like the rest of them. Well, Get saved. Repent, get saved. Well, I, I tried that. Well, try it now with your heart. Because God cannot lie. So if anybody calls upon my name, I'll be there. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Nothing going to change that. Not you, not me, not, not anyone. Not a, not a billion witnesses can change that. 
God's word's true. What he said works. Amen. 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 Uh, God doesn't love me more than he loves you. And it works for me every single day. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Come on, man. Hallelujah. Praise God. I know I can get out of my, I can get myself out of sadness and into joy just as quick as I'm willing to. How quick are you willing to? Just quick as you're willing to. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can get yourself out of hate and into love just as quick as you're willing to. You get yourself out of, out of, out of fear and turmoil and anxiety and stress and to peace as quick as you want to. <laughs> you can get yourself out of badness and the goodness as quick as you want to. Amen. Out of sickness and the health as quick as you want to. Hallelujah. Kambong je repata siki iti pratona. Ale manisitaya. Lukuda sumbunda reti shika. Hela masuta rete. Somebody got a Bible I can look at? <coughs> is, is, that I don't need a um, you know, super magnifying glass to be able to see the. <laughs> Somebody handed me a Bible. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> So I said, Moses' eyes was, wasn't dim. Yeah, but his font wasn't seven point. Either. <laughs> Probably letters about that big. It takes a, it takes a, it's a pretty big character to chisel into rock. You know. <laughs> Praise God. Now, you know, uh, what time is it now? Because I'm going to go too late. Okay, I got a bit more time because I'm trying to keep this to an hour. If you would grab a hold of what I've just told you, if you take a hold of it, you would easily step into the gifts of the Spirit. And especially one of the most important gifts of the Spirit, gift of discerning of spirits. And especially as it most uh, uh, relates to you and how you, it affects you. Because people have classified much of what Satan is doing as their own thoughts. And it's not your own thoughts. It's not valid conclusions of, of the situation that is around you because the only valid conclusion that describes what you're encountering and what you're dealing with is seen through the eyes of the Word of God. All, everything that belongs to sadness, everything that belongs to discouragement, everything that belongs to strife, everything that belongs to envy, everything that belongs to the spirit of offense and most... Most people don't even know how to be, even begin to recognize a demon spirit called offense. It's a very powerful, influential demon spirit. I've watched it impact most everybody that I've ever known. And they never knew what hit them. And all they did was try to rationalize and mitigate it based upon a logical explanation of things and try to gulp it down and say, you know what, you know, I've just got to, you know, I've just got to, I've got to, you know, do what's right here and, and, and step up to you know, the challenging situation and, 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 and be, you know, have a good attitude. Well, that's all, you know, admirable, but it had nothing to do with reality. You're dealing with a demon spirit, and tell you right now, a demon spirit's got more, long, more patience than you do. He's going to wait till he's going he's to have an opportune time, and you're going to ultimately find your last straw, and you're going to crumble under it, and he's going to take you out. But when you begin to understand the discernment of spirit, when, when wisdom, which is the ability to discern, the insights of God, which is the ability to discern, as I said, Solomon said, Lord, I, can, I, don't know, I don't know good for me, but I don't know how to come in, I don't know how to go out. And yet he was, you know, from an intellectual point of view, he was the most educated person on the face of the earth probably at the time. But he recognized he did not have the equipment, the needed equipment to be able to properly deal with things and judge and rule God's people without a special ability that only comes from God. And so the Lord has made that special ability available to every one of us and it's called the spirit of wisdom which God gives liberally to anyone who asks. Once again, go back to the Proverbs, read the Proverbs, understand <clears throat> over and over again <clears throat> how the word of the Lord, how wisdom constantly lifts up her voice. Wisdom's constantly. Wisdom is actually a, a, a synonym with holiness. It's a synonym with holiness. Constantly lifts up her voice calling people to come and grab a hold of the word and live by the word and hearken unto the word and hearken unto the voice of the Lord. And when the word of God is more precious to you than, than precious stones and riches and more precious and important to you than the esteem or men's praises or the value that men put upon yourself or the value that you put upon yourself, 
then all of a sudden it's going to be something that you have, that you know, that you understand, that then ultimately you can live by. But the reality of it is until it becomes that, it's always going to be elusive. It's never going to have a practical outworking in your life. You're going to come, you're going to hear the sermon, you're going to hear the message, you're going to hear the word, but it doesn't really change you. Why? It isn't because of God. It isn't because He's not mobilized a great miracle working power to make it change you. It's because you're not willing to let it change you. And it's proven because you'll rather, you're willing to stay sad than be joyful. You're willing to stay in problems and strife rather than have peace. You're willing to walk in hate and like instead of walk in love. Mm. It's proven there. It's proven right there. We're talking about the Holy Ghost has come to teach you all things, but you're going to have to be willing to be taught. And you're going to have to understand that there's basic fundamental indicators that every one of us have before our eyes that prove to us whether or not we're willing to be taught. And I'm telling you right now, all you need to do is fall down on your knees and say, God, forgive me. I've not been willing to be taught. I want to be, get, be a good student. But many people have no ability to discern between the voice of Satan and the voice of God. So the voice of Satan is louder, speaking louder in their ears than anything else, than any other influence. And so all the voice of Satan is saying, discouragement, discouragement. Yeah, see, you can't do that right either. Hey, there's no hope for you. If you can't get it after this long a time, you might as well give up. Oh, it's too hard. Oh, it's just, it's just, it's just too much. Yeah, that's the voice of Satan. Because we got, God has totally come to be our helper. Holy Ghost come to be our helper, and you can't do it. God, the Holy Ghost, is your helper. This is ridiculous. He's mobilized all in heaven to give us the ability. And you say, you can't do it. Well, that's just ridiculous. I can't stand. I can't stand before the, the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus. I can't stand. You and I live in one of the most critical hours of the day. You are hearing right out of heaven what Father wants to take place. And yet many people, because they are not able to discern the voice of Satan, though they really want to be here, they're not able to stop and refuse and resist the powers of darkness. Ultimately, Play into his game and, all, and as a result, resist the Holy Ghost and silently argue and refuse to hear. And so, you, don't have, you have the same thing. You end up with the same thing. Huh? Now, I want you to pray with me because I'm going to tell you right now, and, and this is for everybody. I, I went home on Wednesday night going, God, what, how, how, what does it take for people to hear? When will they stop, ar stop arguing with you? When will they stop when will they recognize at that what point in time will they recognize that that voice that is discouraging them and making them upset and uncomfortable while I am speaking is a demon spirit? When will that amount of wisdom, which is the basic kind of wisdom, the basic kind of discernment, when will they wake up and recognize that can't be in partnership with the influences of demon spirits and expect to ever be able to walk in the Holy Ghost, to walk in the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit? To be called the sons of God. God has given us great power and he's given us great authority. It's been ours. And he's made us the sons of God. And, and in that, he's given us the ability to see what eyes can't see. But yet we still want to go in and see earthly things. To hear what ears can't hear. But yet we still listen to demon voices. It's got to stop. I'm teaching discernment. I'm teaching you discernment. Hallelujah. It'll save your soul. It would ultimately result in you being used by God so that there would be many signs and wonders which are just simply God's proof. Yeah. Because people need proof. They need proof. They're, it's, they're, everyone is in a melu. Uh, you know, use another great synonym, a gamish. <laughs> of all these various different ideas and everybody's right and everybody's got the truth and everybody knows what they're talking about and everybody knows God better than anybody else. But where's Jesus? And where are the proofs? Where is that wonderful realm of divine glory where everybody comes under the influence of that spirit of prophecy as they touch heaven, as they worship God? You know what happens is so many people begin to worship God and touch heaven and there's a voice that they're constantly used to responding to and coming under the authority of stopping them and hindering them and they do not know how to bust through it. We want to teach you how to bust through it. I believe that if you would hearken unto the voice of the Lord and hear what I'm saying to you, 
and recognize those things that are hindering you, that those aren't your thoughts, but those are the voices of the enemy, and that there is nothing that can hold you back from the wonderful realms of God, but the powers of Satan. And Father's given you all authority over all the powers of darkness to trample over top of them and render them powerless. You and going, all you're going to do is rise up and be more determined. I'm breaking into that realm. I always have revival. I always have the move of God. I always have the move of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because I discovered that you can always have the move of God. (laughs) And therefore, I've just, uh, it's it's available all the time. Now that I've discovered it, I know it's available all the time. So I'm going to have it all the time. I'm in my living room, in my car, at the church, wherever I'm at. No matter what is happening, no matter where we're going through, praise God. (laughs) I was telling Manuel that when I got arrested in Egypt, you know, the guy that was with me, he, you know, that, that, that took me into that part of Egypt, it was Alexandria, Egypt, and it was the backwoods of, the, you know, the edge of town where the worst, worst part of town, I mean, goodness gracious. And, uh, and, of course, that's where the church is in the poorest part of town. That aggravated me to start off with. I mean, all this riches and opulence, and now we've got to go to wherever the sewer's coming out and the garbage dump is, and now we don't have church. Give me a break. I'm like going, this ain't right, and I'm not tolerating it. You know, and that's basically my attitude. God moved in such an incredible way in those meetings. And, um, you know, this guy that was with me, <laughs> bless his heart, you know, he said, I'll never leave you now, I'll never forsake you. It doesn't matter what happens, I'm going to stand with you. And, of course, he spoke Arabic, and I didn't speak Arabic. I mean, my Arabic was very minimal, you know. And, uh, and um, at any rate, here comes the secret police, and, and he's gone. <laughs> He found a sheep. He did a disappearing act that I would have liked to have been able to follow. But <laughs> I mean, that was a smooth move. And so I just got, I, I, you know, basically, I, I didn't even really know what was going on. He knew what was going on. I didn't even get a hello, a warning, run, nothing. I just, he's gone. He's disappeared. I get in the cab. I'm looking around. Next thing I know, they're trying to tip the cab over and got the, you got the, you know, uh, the gun slap in the front end of the of the of the windshield, and the, and the taxi cab driver is crying like a baby. You know, <laughs> he's like, ah! you know, we're in trouble. You know, <laughs> and the and the car is doing this thing right here, man. Hey, man, I'm telling you right now, I'm over here in the realms of divine glory. I'm over here in the Bastakura Masatali Mingiliapata. Because nothing can change what I have. I'm in the heavenly realm. I'm in charge. They're not in charge. They're out there playing games. Hey, stop it! Stop it! So I'm basically, in, 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 all I had was English. I didn't have Arabic. But they got it. And they stopped it. Because authority came out of my mouth. I'm in charge. I'm not being pushed around. Hmm? Hey, you don't even know who you're messing with. Let me see your passport. I got a better passport for you than that. <laughs> of course, by that time, I realized that in, in, a, in, a, in a Middle East nation, whoever yells the loudest wins the argument. <laughs> it's not fist to cuss, it's who? It's a voice exercise. And, and praise God. I mean, you know, there, there just as a matter where you're at, it doesn't matter what's going on, there is a realm of heaven that nothing can intimidate you. Nothing can stop you. You find your place. It ain't about anything other than Jesus Christ, your relationship with him, and, and God's desperation for you to know Jesus on such a level that he gave to us the most sacred one that there is in all of heaven, the Holy Ghost, to live in us to be with us, to reveal everything about heaven to us, to reveal everything about Jesus to us. The fundamental reason everything that the Holy Ghost does is to reveal Jesus. And every, every activity is to reveal Jesus. And he is re- Jesus is revealed through the demonstration of prophecy, through the demonstration of revelation, through the demonstration of the prophetic song. How is it that every one of you, I'm going to say it again, how is it that every one of you have the psalm, a prophetic song? How is it that every one of you have the revelation, so, a, a, a insight now into the things of heaven that weren't, weren't revealed before to you personally? And maybe even to the congregation in which you're in. How is it that every one, not some of you, a few of you, just the pastor? <laughs> But you're not going to have that till you know how to touch heaven. People say, well, when are we going to start doing that? When do you start touching heaven? And, well, okay, what are we going to do? Break through all those lying powers of darkness that you've had no discernment about that has influenced your attitudes and your emotions. 
your conclusions and your decisions. So all of a sudden, an evil spirit comes and begins to discourage you and begins to uh, create uh, um, mountains out of molehills, uh, big events out of some small action. And now you make a decision based upon that. Guess what? You are now walking under the leadership of a demon spirit, not the Holy Spirit. You are being led by the devil. I don't care how much you're not watching television and how, you know, whatever. You're, how many times you're taking a shower. doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, some people I think the only idea they've got is godliness is cleanliness. I mean, you know, come on, people, listen to me. We, we got the wrong ideas of things. <laughs> Being led by the Holy Ghost means I know what he's doing. I know what he's doing. Wisdom is knowing what God is doing and doing it with him. You listen to me. It is. That's to the test of time and it's true. Wisdom knowing what God is doing. God the Holy Ghost is happy. I'm going to stay happy too. God the Holy Ghost is joyful. God the Holy Ghost is confidence. God the Holy Ghost has assurance. God the Holy Ghost has boldness. God the Holy Ghost has peace. God the Holy Ghost has these fundamental things that if you do these things, you know that you're being led of the Spirit because this is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And as I said last time we met, if you're doing these other things, these are the clear evidences of demon spirits. Demon spirits break covenant and fight against covenant. Huh? God the Holy Ghost has never spoken against a, a, a church leader ever. He never has. Christ Jesus never spoken against a church leader. Did you notice that? He said, unto the messenger of the church, I write. Hmm? And he dealt with the things that were going on with the church. And the messenger was the same as the candlestick. He said, you repent or I'm going to move your candlestick from you. You listen to me. A demon possessed saw is going to be upheld by God because the anointing of leadership is on him. Huh? And even a leader who's going to crucify Christ because he's in that position, and he sits in the office of that anointing, we will prophesy even though he doesn't know and say, isn't it expedient that one die for all other than a whole, that rather, rather than a whole nation perish? And Caiaphas prophesied because he was in the position of the high priest. But yet, Satan in these last days brings even greater railings and accusations against authorities, against leaders, because he's a rebel. By definition, he is a descender. He is one of sedition. He is the defier. He is the accuser. He is the slanderer. That is the voice of a demon spirit. People do not have in the churches, do not have by and large the ability to discern evil spirits on the most gross and apparent level. How are you going to ever get anywhere else? It's always going to be a mixture. And if you don't have discernment of spirits, you're not going to walk in the word of knowledge. It's going to be polluted. This is a, this is a key. It's a key. And, and the reason it's a key is it, it's broken up, open for us just a little bit more here to help you understand that it is a key. Discernment is a key. Here in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, those who are matured. And how did they mature? By reason that they have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. How you mature? Because you got your senses recognized, matured enough, you're able to discern good and evil. You're able to discern the influence of an evil spirit fundamentally because this is where it all comes down to. This is where this is the least common denominator on every single thing. This is where it ultimately finally finds all of its similarity and commonality. What Satan in the demonic realm is doing through his craft and treachery and what God the Holy Ghost in his grace and mercy is doing in his long-suffering pleading with the church to step over into the manifest person of Jesus Christ to live out that divine realm of glory. Mm. Now, it's a, God's going to, be, to, for you ever walk in discernment, get this thing right, you're going to have to readjust everything. God has to be number one. You're not going to be led by the Holy Ghost unless God's number one. Mm -hmm. Unless the kingdom's number one. It's the rules. It's the principles. It's the principles of life. There's rules to this relationship. It's number one. Once you've been born of God, obviously that's first. You've got to be born of the Spirit. You've got to have a new heart and a new spirit. If you don't have a new heart and a new spirit, you can't understand a word the Holy Ghost is saying. 
If you don't have a new heart and new spirit, all you're going to do is you're going to have an affinity to an evil spirit. That's all you're going to be stuck. At best, you could have cultic ritual in religion. That's it. So we get a new heart, we get a new spirit. Now our, our spirit's joined under the Holy Spirit. My spirit's joined under the Holy Ghost. You've got to be kidding me. I'm one with him? Yeah, one. Huh? Just like, just like the Father was in Jesus, Jesus is in me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Huh? Now I accept all that. I'm, that's the word of God and that's my beginning. That's where we begin. Now I'm able then now to discern good and evil. Because my spirit will join one with the Holy Spirit. And then, oh, not only that, not only that, the Word of God gives me light and instruction. He helps me understand where to take my next step because His Word is lamp to my feet, light unto my path. And I know what exactly where I'm going. I know, is that a step of evil or is that a step of good? Is that a step of death or is that a step of life? Is that a, is that a pit to fall in or is that a step up into the realms of glory? Huh? Is that a demon influence or is that the influence of the Holy Ghost? Are you listening to me? Yes. It's true. People want to sit around today, they're so mixed up, they're so befuddled. And it's a good word, bewitched or befuddled, either one. Paul said bewitched, he did. <clears throat> he said bewitched in Galatians chapter 5, who has bewitched you? Because it is, it's, it's the craft of Satan mm -hmm. that you should believe another gospel. Huh? People are so befuddled, that as, soon, as soon as you start seeing expressions of the Holy Ghost in church, like... Joy unspeakable, just exuberant joy and rejoicing. All of a sudden, oh, well, that's Hinduism. Yeah, that's Hindus. That's what the Hindus do. That's the demon power. Well, if that's the demon power, if that's the joy that the demon power has, I'd like to see the joy the Holy Ghost got. Because my goodness, it must be, how is that goodness great? Ah, my, because everything that God's got is so far more wonderful and beautiful. And besides that, Hindus don't have that kind of joy. That's a lie right out of the pit of hell. That's make-believe. That's people who are fighting the Holy Ghost and standing in an altar of, of, of sacredness. And I, I'd hate to be in your shoes on the day of judgment. Because you know it's a lie, and I know it's a lie. You get around those ceremonies that those Hindus are doing, and they're being possessed by demons, and it, the place is charged with, it's worse than watching a horror film. It's charged with death and fear and every unholy thing. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. So that everywhere we go, it's like everything that the Holy Ghost is doing on every front, everything that the Holy Ghost is doing, Satan is trying to block it out. God's going to do what he does through his covenant people. And if some church somewhere doesn't take a hold of life and reality and wants to continue doing whatever it is it's been doing, look, give me a break. I'm not going there, man. I'm here, I'm here to grab a hold of that which was poured out on the day of Pentecost and living it. I'm here to live out that life that was given to me, that was shown and revealed in Christ Jesus, the eternal word. I'm not interested in cultic religion. Yeah. And cultic religion, and people, that's one another thing people don't understand, the difference between cultic and occult. Most churches practice cultic religion. All the Old Testament ritual was cultic by definition. It's going through a practice. It's a form. There's these certain things you do. You approach the altar like this. You do these things. You say these words. And that's what you do every time. Relationship now brings a liberty to interact with the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Huh? My, my, my. We don't know whether we're going to sing first or dance first. We don't know whether we're going to. We don't know whether we're going to preach first or pray first. We don't know whether we're going to take the offering first. Say, I'm not cultic. The only thing you could say that we have as a cultic practice is that we still have, we have worship. Where we sing. Well, I should say where we sing because it, it does not necessarily worship. Because worship is where your whole life becomes an offering turned in, as it were, a vaporized turned into smoke. It goes into heaven. That's worship. Fire comes down upon you, turns the offering into smoke. Amen. That's how worship is defined. It's the complete surrender of all your heart, touching heaven, because all you want is Jesus. You're not thinking about nothing. You're not thinking about the dog, the roast. You're not thinking about the promotion or the demotion. You're not thinking about this or that. You're captivated. Holy Ghost wants to do one thing. He wants to show us Jesus. And when you see Jesus, I'm telling you, you're captivated. You're going to have to understand what you've been doing is not right. You can say all you want to that you're being led by the Holy Ghost. You may say you want to be led. But it's a big difference to being wanting to be led and being led. Being led has very definite results, very definite 
indications and elements associated with it. It is not subjective. It's not arbitrary. It's this one way. When you are led of the Holy Ghost, you see Jesus. You behold him. You are captivated by him. There is no other influence in your spirit but love and joy and peace and divine glory and heaven. That's it. Now people come into the church all the time and they are loaded down with all kinds of emotions and feelings and attitudes and things. And they never get past it. They're imprisoned by it. The demon power has authority over them. They do not have any discernment to recognize it. So there is no will to move past it. This has got to change. This has got to change. This has got to change. You need to talk to people around you. You need to encourage people around you. There is no reason why I should feel the hindrances that I felt in the meetings as I felt on, on Wednesday night. And as I felt a week ago Sunday, there's no reason I should have to feel that. And as I felt again a week ago Wednesday, it's whole new stuff. I know what the repercussions are from. It's because you've been going out into the street and you've been going into the enemy's territory and you do not know how to stand against his repercussions because you've listened too long to his voice and his influence and he will lie against the truth and thus create within you an opposition to the anointing. An opposition which can express itself in so many ways in your mind and your thinking, your thoughts and your attitudes. You're going to have to get discernment. The only way you're going to get discernment is you're going to have to grow up. Paul said at full age, he said, grow up. He says, strong meat belongs to those who've grown up. No one who's grown up or thinks they're grown up likes to hear, grow up. <laughs> right? That's an insult. You insulted me now. No, I'm not being insulted. I'm like going, come on, Lord. That's what I want. I'm not being insulted. I, there, there ain't nothing can insult me coming out of heaven. Nothing insult me from this word of God. Nothing insult me when I hear somebody by the spirit with passion calling the church to Jesus Christ, calling the church into a realm of heaven, calling the church into a place of submitting to the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm not going, whoa, it's, it's on the move. Somebody else is talking now too. Somebody else lifting up their voice like a trumpet and has there for their cause the passion and will of the Father. Where's your passion? Where's your will? The Lord says, on that day, there will be many who said, who said that they said, Lord, Lord, and they did all these things, but they never did the will of the Father. The most important thing in that message is that the most important thing that you and I do is the will of the Father. The will of the Father is made known right here. He wants Jesus to be glorified. He doesn't want his name profaned anymore. Hallelujah. He doesn't want his church to look like dark shadows. I'm going to say that again. He does not want his church to look like dark shadows. A sequel to another <laughs> dark movie where everybody's sad and sorrowful and heavy in heart. God said, I will not accept such an offering. People don't know that Satan knows how to ultimately invalidate you. And he knows how to do it perfectly. He knows that all he's got to do is get you murmuring and complaining and there's nothing that father is more set against than murmuring and complaining. It wasn't for adultery and fornication that Israel was cut off. It was for murmuring and complaining. Go read Hebrews 3 and 4. Satan knows how to invalidate you before the presence of God and how to bring you into a place of subjugation to him where he has the right to keep you from that which Jesus purchased for you at Calvary. You decide whether or not he's going to have that right. It fundamentally comes down to discernment. The Lord wants you to be led. Holy Ghost wants you to be led. He's going to lead you through leadership. Does that make any sense to you? Yes. So he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And he says, if you're not going to be led by them, you'll never be led by me. If you rebel against them, you're going to be rebe you'll rebel against me. So I'm going to try you because I'm going to send the Holy Ghost upon you. But not only the Holy Ghost, I'm going to send fire on you because I'm going to try you. I'm going to prove every man's work of whether it be in God or not. I'm going to try it whether it's going to be wood, stubble, hay, or whether it's gold, silver, and precious things. Come on now. When you can wake up to the reality of what's going on, then all of a sudden you can now step up and begin to participate by being that much more dependent upon the Holy Ghost. I tell the Holy Spirit continually, Lord, you know I can't do anything without you. And Lord, on Wednesday night, you, you weren't willing because of the people and what was going on in the environment of the church to move. And so what am I supposed to do now? Please don't leave me here by myself. 
You listen to me now. You listen to me now. I'm going to tell you right now, singularly important to me above everything else is the Holy Spirit. And I don't care. You can have a church filled of people and everybody be sitting there with a painted smile like a clown upon their face. Huh? Ain't nothing going to happen in the place. Ain't nothing going to happen in the place. You run everything off that's not right with God, everything that is wrong. And what's going to happen is this. God, the Holy Ghost is going to show up and ultimately there will be a great outpouring of his spirit in the land. So what I'll do is I call the fire of God down on the thing. And I say, Lord, I don't have the ability to know how to sort this thing out. So I call your fire down on it now in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And, and I'm, I'm not letting you go. I'm going to grab a hold of you. So, so I talk like that in the Lord, even in the context of the church, because I'm going, it's going off in my head. And there he just comes. He just starts moving. I'm not in here with you. I'm, I'm going to knock this thing up. I'm going to knock this thing upside the head. I'll straighten it out. I'll jerk it around. Huh? And into to the proper position. Mm-hmm. People say, ah, uh, people sit there and say, oh, well, the anointing's not quite as strong tonight. Yeah, it's because of your attitude. <laughs> the anointing's not quite as strong tonight because of your attitude. Because you have no discernment. You don't understand. You're allowing wrong influences to touch your attitude. I asked the Lord one time, a long time ago, I used to ask him more and more and over and over again. I said, Lord, give me a greater anointing than the, op- the influence of the opposition. <laughs> and, and, and the Lord had mercy on me because, I mean, I was in a situation where, Lord, this opposition is amazing. I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want to go. I'll say whatever you want to say. I'll be whatever you want me to be. I'll be crucified for you. I'll die for you. It doesn't matter. You know I will. And, uh, but Lord, this, this is, is intense, you know. And then when you begin to get the discernment of spirit, when you, spirits, when you mature enough to where they, now in your own life, you know when Satan's trying to mess with you, you know. You know when he's trying to give you a bad attitude. You know when, he's, when things are breaking out, situations are breaking out that are fully demonically orchestrated and you don't have anything to do with you. Foul spirit, get out of here. And you just get happy when, you know, the situation would be sad. You rejoice when the situ- situation would make you mad. You with me? You just don't go with him anymore. You don't respond to his influence. You're not a puppet on a string. You, do, you don't make a decision after anything that he suggests. you right here with the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm locked in here going and doing exactly what the Holy Ghost says. I'm going to get happy right now. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, that kind of thing. No matter what's going on, I'm going to get happy right now. Amen. Hallelujah. No matter what's happening, no, we can't blame it on anybody. There's no excuse for not following the Holy Ghost. His influence and his, his, in, in his uh, working it should be greater than all the other influences and all the other working. If you love him, all that matters is what he, what's important to him. That's all going to be important to you. And nothing can separate you from him. No power of the darkness can separate from you from him unless you allow it. Unless you come under that influence and begin to agree with it. Huh? Man, man, let me just say this. You know, every one of us have, you know, to some degree we've come through some bad situations. Some of you have actually had uh, addictions in your life, for example. And maybe in that addiction in your life that you had and now you're stepping out to walk with the Lord... Here you are, that thing's continually repeating in your mind. You might even be seeing pictures and seeing images and, you know, feeling sensations from that thing. And what you do in faithfulness to God, you, you resist it steadfast in the faith. And you say, oh, God, I don't want that. Lord, I don't want that in my mind. Father, come and help me in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ against all these things. Father, I thank you that you wash my mind with the water of your word. I thank you that you strengthen me by your spirit. And we just, you just stay there. And maybe the prayer meeting lasts an hour long. And then you find, wow, all of that suggestion, all of those uh, images, all of those feelings, all those sensations are totally gone. Okay. Now, what happens if you yield to it and you agree with it? It stays with you. But if you resist it and you're doing what I'm saying, it's going to be totally gone. It's totally gone. And then every time that attack comes, it's less and less and less. I remember people talking to me about, oh, man, there's no way I could ever quit smoking cigarettes or never quit doing this, quit doing that. I said, no, 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 no. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of darkness off of you. I bind the demon spirit. It goes from me now. It's gone. Now it's gone. Well, I'm free. Now all you got to do is, now when the thing comes back at you, resist it steadfast in faith. Just simply ask the Lord to strengthen you. Simply re- say, just take the, the authority of the name of Jesus and resist it and, and don't allow that thought to, and that emotion and that feeling to stay on you. And then what happens and, uh, over and over again? Hey, yeah, it keeps getting less and less and less and less. And now, you know, you see them five, ten years later and you ask them, hey, how, how's things been going with that, that problem you had? What, what problem? What are you talking about? Remember that thing that was so big you couldn't have? It was an insurmountable problem? Oh, you mean that? 
Well, I haven't thought of it for years. Yes, yeah, the way it all works. It's the way it all works. Well, the more subtle ones are the more subtle ones we keep agreeing with them. We keep agreeing with them because they, they aren't quite as overt. And, 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 but yet they keep us from being able to take a hold of God in the fundamental areas of our life and function in the discernment and the authority that has been given to us that we've never willing been, been willing to appropriate because we've never seen the importance of it. And it's like, oh, so, so what if I want to be sad? So what you're saying, God doesn't love me because I want to be sad. Well, with that attitude, I'm saying that absolutely. I mean, he loves you like he loves the world, but he doesn't love you like your best friend because he's not your best friend. You want him to accommodate what you want. You want the Holy Ghost to come mixed with your lie and your deception and your emotion. God's not going to do it. He's calling you out of it. He's not there in there with you in it. Huh? Where were you? You know, this, 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 this popular belief is, you know, there was two sets of sand prints. There were two sets of prints in the sand and they became one. I asked the Lord what happened to that one. The, the other one I was carrying. No, I wasn't. Now, it's a voluntary agreement of your will, and he ain't walking around down here on this earth. You walking around up in heaven. Amen. Because it's in the heavenly realm that we walk with him. Hallelujah. It's in the heavenly realm. We see it in the heavenly places. Get out of the earthly realm. Get out of the sensual realm. Huh? Get out of it. Don't give yourself over to the fleshly realm in that sense. Because the fleshly realm in that sense is a demonic realm. See, Jesus was manifested in the flesh, but he wasn't in the fleshly realm. Does that make sense to you? You understand that? Yes. Scripture says that Jesus suffered in the flesh mm -hmm. and that we are supposed to suffer likewise. He's not talking about a demonic realm, is he? Huh? Did you know he suffered being tempted? You know, the temptation is supposed to not be something that's a thrill. It's supposed to be something that's suffering because now you recognize, wait a minute, that's the influence of the demonic. I don't want that. But now all of a sudden, if it becomes, it's painted to be some great desire that you really just got to have because it's just a pleasure you can't do without. Now all of a sudden, it's kind of, kind of some, quite somewhat entertaining, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Huh? Oh, yeah, it is. But when it becomes for real what it is, because you have discernment, because you have your senses exercised to discern good and evil, then all of a sudden you recognize, wait a minute, that is a demonic power of darkness that hates me, that wants to torment me, that wants to ultimately destroy my soul in hell. No, no, it's another picture. Uh, another picture here. <laughs> the, 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 the battle is afoot. <laughs> and we're going to see some people rise up and no longer be instruments of unrighteousness or weapons of unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Go start on a you. You know what? In any meeting, I don't need to get in agreement with you. Did you know that? I should get louder. Of course, they don't have a speaker. But, you know, in a, in a meeting, I, you know, I don't have to get in agreement with you. But you do have to get in agreement with me. That is absolutely it. That is fundamentally it. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There is no maybe so about it. You have to by mandate. And if you disagree with me, you disagree with God by virtue of the very position of the authority that I'm in as I'm speaking as a mouthpiece and an oracle of God. And then when you cooperate with that, then ultimately you step in to speaking as a mouthpiece and an oracle of God. But if you don't submit to that process and you're, you're not going to submit to nothing, then how are you going to get promoted into the things of God as a rebel? Because God, the Holy Ghost, has nothing to do with rebellion or dissension or sedition or strife or envy or evil speakings. Even if it's evil speaking, if it's an evil thought, an evil speaking against someone as a thought, you need to deal with it like you should with authority in intensity before it be, it's manifested as an action because every action begins as the thought. Hmm? Yeah. Those thoughts aren't just about experience. Now, we know that we know that God retains something, a distinction in the difference between good and evil. And he said, it's mine and Adam, you, don't, you can't have it. You're over there in just a good land. You're good, everything's good. Huh? Everything's pure, everything's holy. Satan was able to deceive this Adam and Eve. Huh? And I like to say Chava in the Hebrew language, which means the mother of all living. Just to make the point clear. There ain't no evolution in a couple different family lines. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, and at that time it was okay for a brother and a sister to get married. And that wasn't situational ethics. So take that and figure that one out. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't strain too hard because God's right every time. 
Don't try to make God wrong because you don't understand it. Because we do that all the time. Try and make God wrong. I'm bringing that up. Only one that one reason. I just want to pull that one trigger on you. Huh? Hallelujah. Right? Here we are all sitting in here. And then everybody just lift their hands and begin to get full of joy. Hallelujah. Just like, how, how, you know, how quickly does it take you to get a smile? How, how quickly does it take you not to get a smile so you can please the pastor? <laughs> and cooperate with the leadership, which is admirable. Which is admirable. Probably the first step. Probably the first step. It probably is, right? Because otherwise you just like naming. I'm not washing in the Jordan. I'm not washing that muddy river. We got better rivers. I mean, our worst river up there in Syria is better than your, than your best river. What are you talking about? Get out of here. And he's got some reasonable servant saying, look, you know, if you would have made a request for you to you know, go kill a nation, destroy a nation, would you have done it? And then he's like, he's just ask you to go wash in a muddy river. Go wash in the muddy. Go wash in the Jordan. Huh? Because God does some strange things sometimes like that. He said, I just want you to do this and I'm going to bless you. Huh? Yeah. Come here, I'm going to spit in your eye. <laughs> I'm not letting nobody spit in my eye. Well, they stay blind. Because <laughs> there's no choice. So you begin to cooperate with leadership. You prosper if you obey the word of the prophet. That's, right. and, uh, that, 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 that's God's man speaking on his behalf. Hallelujah. You hook up with that prophecy because I tell you, out of my belly flows the spirit of prophecy, the working of revelation and knowledge. You hook up with that and you're going to have it too. That's the beautiful thing about it. And Satan knows it. So therefore, he's going to do everything he can possibly do, run interference, keep you from hooking up. Because if you get it two, then he's got two people to deal with. And then you get it three, then he's got three. And if you get a hundred, he's got a hundred. And you get a thousand. It's just he can't do anything. He's going to do everything he can do. Shut it down before it gets started. To kill the baby before it matures. That's what he does. Try to kill Moses before there was a sign, possibility, that the anointing was going to start moving in the land and that the people of God was going to rise up. Kill them all! That's right. That's what happened. Kill every male. Same thing. Jesus comes along, right? They, they hear, hear a little voice about, hey, the people of God's about to rise up. There's going to be a great revival. A moving of God. The great anointing is about to break forth. Kill it all! Kill everything that moves. Kill it while it's a baby before, before it can live. Because if it gets too strong, we won't be able to stop it. If it gets to a point where we, we won't be able to stop it. Hallelujah. It's true. It's true. To be able to discern your times and your seasons. They, were, they, they knew the word of God, but they were so caught in religion and such bad attitudes and under the influences of, of demon spirits that Jesus looks to the covenant people and says, your father is the devil. God had ordained that God, the Father, would have been their father at that time. But their father was the devil. They were the church people of the Jesus day. Elisha said some of the same things. Isaiah said some of the same things to the people who were sitting in the church. Supposedly, we know better. We know we right. Who are you to come in here and tell us what we uh, we got to go to the other church? Where we can feel better. I want to feel better about me. I want to feel better about you. Huh? What's going to feel better about me? I'm, look, man, I want him. I want, I, want, I want Jesus. I want everything that he, whatever, what price is it to pay? He prayed the, paid the ultimate price beyond what we can imagine so that we can be with him. Are we willing to pay the price so that we can be with him? And really, in many respects, to say so that he could be with us. I know, I, know, I know he's trying to talk us in this. He ordained us. I take the load off. He ordained me to be with him. I'm not going to struggle with this. He ordained you to be with him. He chose you. He said that you could have greatness. You don't have to convince him. He's saying, look, obey my word. Do the simple things I told you to do. This is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. Get happy. That's what he said. In all things, give thanks. That's what he said. You can't give thanks without happy. Because... Thanks, the thanksgiving offering is the halil, the praise, the shimka, in the joy of rejoicing, the ecstatic joy. That's what the shimka is. The shimka is where we get where we get the word rejoicing in the Old Testament, and that is to be ecstatically joyful. And the the, the and the Hasidics try to do it, you know, because they understand it. And, and the Hasidics are, are the people who are supposed to be the modern day Haradim, and so they go after it, man. They try to get themselves all worked up with the joy, and they get all ecstatic, try to dance around, get all happy. But they just all it's all out of a human effort. There's a realm of the Holy Ghost that says, okay, I'm gonna do this for you right now. But you've got to be willing. You got to. You have to be willing. You have to say, I'm not willing to be as 
I was. I'm not willing to be in that state. I'm willing to do the will of the Father. And as soon as you do and you lay hold on that, there maybe it's a simple act of obedience. Huh? Then there is a divine realm that comes. And so if all of a sudden we, we I just I said, yield to that divine realm, get happy right now. Let's begin to joy and rejoice. And you simply know how to yield to that divine realm. <laughs> Step over into that one place of peace, because peace comes with it. Step over in that one realm of love, which love comes with it. Now all of your problems, all of your insecurities, all the things that were there, nay, they all gone. They all gone because you caught up in the heaven. You don't even remember what was wrong with you in earth, <laughs> earthly realm. Huh? And now you're all rejoicing, all happy and caught away. You should be able to feel that right now just by me saying it. Some people can, some people can't. It's based on how you receive. It's all about on how you receive. You listen to me right now. It has to do with the level of your spiritual ability to discern. It has all to do with how much you yield to the Holy Ghost and don't yield to the Holy Ghost. How much? Because the more you yield to Him, the easier it is to yield to Him. The more you give yourself to Him, give place to Him, the easier it is to give place to Him. It's just that simple. It isn't any more difficult than that. If you want to, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to have the Holy Ghost begin to reap uh, unlimited, immeasurable life. And we want to just classify it as eternal life and just call it something that's going to happen in life hereafter. Eternal life is just as much a quality as it is a quantity of life and time. Hallelujah. It's true. And so I, I want you to learn how to walk in the Spirit. I want you to learn how to be led by the Spirit. I want you to learn how to yield to the Holy Ghost because it is the definition of those who are truly the sons of God. So you've been given the power and authority to be the sons of God so that you fundamentally can now be led by the Holy Ghost, walk in the Holy Ghost, live by the Holy Ghost, have a conduct and manner of life after the Holy Ghost who brings to us all the instruction in how to act and, pertain, act and be in every way as it, you're supposed to act and be in heaven and have all the characteristics and manner and beauty and splendor of this abundant life the Father himself has, his attributes and characteristics of life. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here you are in that place right now because, you know, I'm there right now. You're connected with me. You've got to be there too. Yes. Huh? Yes. Is that right? Is that not true? If you were holding my hand and I jumped in the water, would you be in the water too? Yes, you would be in the water too. He would be in. if I was standing on a cliff and you were holding my hand. We go some places. We go swimming. You know when the water's flowing really nice and it's getting deep. And if you're holding my hand on the cliff, I'm not gonna let you go. If you said you're jumping in with me, I'm gonna jump. You're gonna be in the water. You're not gonna be up on the cliff. You'll be in the water with me. If you connected with me, you're gonna feel what I feel. Now you had to deal with well, why, 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 why can't I get connected? And it doesn't really have anything to do with me personally. It's just connecting with the, 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 that person who stands in the office of speaking on behalf of the Father, the mouthpiece of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter whether I'm here or that other church or in that other nation or in that other situation. I'm just connected. I'm in Pado Sto today. I, you know, I spent so much time studying the Word of God, knowing the Word of God. I would go into many situations with other ministries, and they would be saying things that I knew just simply. Just, that's just men's doctrine and nothing to do with the Bible. But you know what I did? I just categorize that and put it aside and I don't let that hinder me because I know I'm supposed to keep the unity of the peace and the bond. I know I'm supposed to keep the unity of peace and the bond of love. Huh? Unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. I'm supposed to keep the unity of peace and bond of love too. Okay? So listen, I just say I'm staying right there. I'm not going to get over here and start thinking, oh, well, I don't agree with that because all I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate myself. I'm going to lose connectivity. I'm not going to be willing to go with them because I've somehow invalidated them. No, I'm going to stay with them. I'm going to stay hooked up. I'm going to, I'm going to just set that aside. Man, I feel the anointing. I'm going to stay right here over here with the anointing because none of us know what we're talking about. Only God knows what he's talking about anyways. He wants us to be able to have he didn't, he, 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 the fruit of the Spirit. He didn't say the fruit of the Spirit is to be able to quote Scripture. He didn't say that. He didn't say the fruit of the Spirit is to be able to understand every doctrine accurately. He didn't say that. He said the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and goodness. Hallelujah. And, and all these wonderful things that are quality of life stuff. I mean, we're not asking you to do great and crazy things. We're asking you to do simple, beautiful things. Amen. 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 Nobody should have a problem with and so I'm just going to back up. I want to read this and then I'm going to close because I'll probably run out of time. I'm trying to talk. I'm trying to talk at double speed so I can get twice as much done in the same amount of time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hooks me up with the Holy Ghost. It is a oneness. It connects me. It connects me. It connects me with the Holy Ghost in a very unique way in the school of the prophets. It connect, and it connects God's people together. It brings God's people together. Manifestation of the Spirit actually produces unity. 
causes unity. And in fact, in Matthew, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the scripture says, manifestation of the Spirit is given to every one or every person to bring us together. I know it said in King James, to profit with all, but the Greek language literally says to bring us together. Together. It hooks us up with the same language. Now we speak with one new tongue, one new language. Hallelujah. And none of us know what we're talking about, but God the Holy Ghost does. And that's a very good thing. And out of our belly flows this realm of divine influence that we're not governing. I'm governing. I can govern to some degree and should govern always what's saying that coming out of my mouth. Right? And I can tell you that when I begin to speak by the Spirit, when I, with words that you can understand, many times I'm not governing that. It's God the Holy Ghost. His Papa saying, not to say that I don't get a couple words in edgewise, because I do from time to time. I get my opinion in there, huh? And sometimes I, I'll get overwhelmed by, you know, certain situations and say, look, this is ridiculous or whatever. And the Lord said, no, 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 stay with the program, stay with the program. We're just going to keep prophesying to him, amen. <laughs> huh? So, you know, I love to talk, when I'm talking about this verse of Scripture here in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, I love to think about Samuel. God, bore, God birthed, as it were, the school of the prophets with Samuel. He did that. That's how he did. Now, I do know that when he anointed the 70 in Israel, he made them evangelists. How many of you knew that? Remember when Moses was, was there governing all of the people and people just weren't listening? They just weren't listening. They just, just, God wanted to bring the spirit, wanted to elevate the spirituality of Israel. And so he said to, his, he said to Moses, he said, give in part that grace that's on you and 70 others also. What happened as soon as the Spirit of God came upon people just to give them an ability, just a little bit of an ability? Huh? What happened? What happened? They all began to do what? Prophesy. Because now they were going to have an ability where they spoke by the Spirit of the Lord. So prophecy is always there. You know, you know the whole story. Joshua's all upset because there's people prophesying, you know, and, 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 and he doesn't want anybody prophesying but Moses because he's a champion for Moses. Moses doesn't want God to write prophesy. And hearing all these other guys prophesying now. But Moses goes, what does Moses say? Moses said, I would that all, I would have all, I would that all Israel would prophesy. Because what was he expressing? Was he expressing Moses' will, Moses' desire? He's telling what God wants of his people. And so the prophet said, in the last days shall come to pass, I pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and then you shall all prophesy. And so God's saying that his church is full of prophets, and I can show you that over and over again, so that when you see the working operation of the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you may all prophesy one by one, and then what's going to happen is the unbeliever is going to come in, and the thoughts of their hearts are going to be revealed, and then falling down, they're going to say, truly God is in this place. And that's, this is Holy Ghost conviction. If there's anything that we want, and if there's anything that God wants, is he wants a greater Holy Ghost conviction in his house, and it's not happening, because every man's turned to his own thoughts and turned to government by his own opinion. And it's time to stop and to face the rebellion, uh, the spirit of rebellion and dissension and sedition that has influenced every single person on the planet and recognize the enemy for it is and let God shine the floodlight of heaven upon your soul and give you wisdom and insight and discernment so that you can recognize how much rebellion and dissension and sedition you've been under the influence of so you can rise up against it in the strength of the Lord and the power of his might and say, No more! Amen. Because I know the Holy Ghost ain't going to agree with that. And so therefore I'm going to be limited. And we're just going to be shut down. And we're going to have one little expression. And we're not going to be able to hardly get anywhere. And whatever bit of, little, bit of ten, little bit of ground we seem to gain, it, we lose it the next day as it were. That stuff's got to stop. But so day 70 became evangelists in Israel. And they went around preaching to elevate the spirituality. Helping everybody understand. Here's the will of God. Here's what God. They became preachers in the camp of Israel. But then the school of the prophets began with, with Samuel. And you can see where Samuel ga ga gained his discernment to hear the voice of God. What he was, what, what, first of all, he was dedicated to the Lord. That's the first thing that needs to happen. We're dedicated to the Lord. In other words, we're sanctified by the Holy Ghost. He brings us in. Now we, now we consecrate ourselves. We dedicate ourselves. His mama dedicated him, and he had no choice. The little guy, mama's leaving him. You can stay here with the prophet Eli. But he's fat and blind and ugly. And, and this is like my room. And why you got to leave me? And don't you worry. I, you, you belong to the Lord. And, and, you imagine what happened? that was? That went down. That wasn't pretty. And he had to work through it. He cried a couple of nights. He cried himself to sleep because he's just like any other normal little boy leaving mama to now have to live over here in this old man's house. <laughs> you listen to me. It's true. It's true. But he found himself a place and comfortable he got there slaying in the holies of holies. My goodness. 
He, that's where his bedroom was in the holy place just outside the holies of holies because it was his job to make sure that the light didn't go out. And it's the ministry of the revelation of the word of God. And he learned there to prophesy as he gave himself to the word of God, to knowing the will of the Father. And he became, he became a, a man like no other man had ever been in that office. And out of that office sprang up the Elijah. Out of that office sprang up all of the great prophets that we then read about and, and are, 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 are blessed by. And when we look, look, look here, we recognize that there's a dedication and consecration that each one of us must have to God. We're going to have to quit living by our own word and start living by His word. We're going to have to conform into our own ideas and make believing and making up as we go and start getting disciplined about saying, this is how I live and this alone, this alone is how I live in this realm of the influence of the Holy Spirit. And, I, and it's not subjective. I know just what it looks like. And I'm going to start where I know and understand and then God's going to take me because I'm willing to start where I know and understand like joy and peace and love and goodness and walking in this place of agreement and humility and meekness. Oh, you know what? I know there's been people. I've seen people. I've known people. The men of God, they had great humility before the Lord, but they were not meek. They had a great humility before the Lord. But for, for one reason or the other, they were disagreeable. And always held them back. They had great calling of God, but they were just disagreeable. There was, there was that problem of dissension. And, and we just couldn't have to say, well, I'm going to have every part of my life conformed to the, to the Lord. So I'm going to finish this. So many things to say, but start with what you know. Start with what the, what the Holy Ghost has been telling you. Amen. Amen. Practice this. <laughs> Check yourself throughout the day and say, is it still there? <laughs> Hold it there. Pray in the Holy Ghost till the joy comes. Pray in the Holy Ghost till the... When the joy comes, the love is there and the peace is there too. When the love, just the joy is a little bit more overt. Huh? When you're happy, the joy, is, when the, the joy of the Lord is there. The joy of the Lord be strength. Is there anything wrong with joy? Is there any law against joy? You can only have so much joy. If you get too much joy, then that's wrong. <laughs> against these things, there are no what? Laws. Laws. Huh? That's true. Hallelujah. Oh, mighty God. I want to get right into teaching you how to function in the gift of discerning of spirits. And, but I'm going to tell you something. There is a number of things that you've got to be able to deal with before mm -hmm. the discerning of spirits can function and operate in your life and you even be able to handle it. Imagine you're having problems loving people right now and now as it, as it stands and you don't even know nothing. Now all of a sudden you know something and you go, oh no, they did that. <laughs> right? So... Not understanding how to walk in the love of God cause you to get to discerning spirit would cause you to separate from people. Well, I'm not hanging out with them no more. I thought they were better than that. Well, Jesus is hanging out with you and he knows everything about you. <laughs> so you're going to have to get over in there in that love. You're going to have to learn how to bring, you're going to have to learn how to walk in mercy and grace. Hallelujah. There, see, the foundation has to be laid. There has to be the right principles and right reactions and right attitudes in our life fundamentally first before the Lord can go ahead and add those things that he's desperate to get to us. You understand? We're going to get there. The Lord said these bones will live. Amen. Father has purposed. I mean, there, Father has purposed a great revival, a great moving of spirit in Southern California. Amen. And there's some people that are just dedicated and going to labor here until it happens. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to weary. And I'm not going to faint. The Lord said, if you don't worry in well-doing, you shall reap if you do not faint. Amen. All I got to do, and Satan will do everything he possibly could do to make you weary and make you faint. And you're going to have to have a discernment of the actions and the strategies of Satan and be not ignorant to his devices and then rise up knowing and recognize what he's doing. Rise up in the authority of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ break that power because Satan has to listen to everything you have to say. You can cast out every devil that exists. Everyone. Amen. 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 Praise God. Says Paul, poor Paul, isn't Paul? Paul. He says, for when the time had come that you should be teachers, you are in need 
Did someone teach you again what is the first principles of those things which God has spoken? First principles. So he's going to say, you're going to get, you don't have the, your foundation's not right. You're not allowing the first things in your life to have its place, and that's why the rest of it's not working. Your love life's not right. That's why faith's not working, in other words. Huh? For everyone, he says, for everyone, he says, and, and you need the principle, first principles of the oracles of God or those things which the Lord has spoken, and are become such as need milk and not strong meat. He says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a baby. And he basically talking about not having really truly been drawn from the breast. So he's a little bit tougher than I am about, you know, I'm tired of doing nursery ministries. Are you with me? He just said it a different way. He got a little bit more graphic. Are you with me? Are you listening to me? Come on, because why? There's a passion on the inside of us. We, we, didn't, we weren't born with it. Not into this life by our parents. We were born with it by the Spirit of the living God. Father put a mandate on us. And he said, this is where the church has got to go. This is what I purpose you to do. You do it. You go after it. You understand me. I do not have to agree with you, but you have to agree with me. And any leader that God has placed in a church, you, they do not have to agree with you. You have to agree with them. You have to. Because that's the way it works. And I hope that that doesn't need a whole lot more explanation so you can figure it out. Are you with me? I know you are. He says, so he says, he really brings it down to how skillful are you in the word? How much do you understand about what the word of God is describing to you and telling you? Really, how much are you willing to live by the word? Amen. Amen. Because if you'll live by it, if you'll be skillful in the word, through the use of it, through the use of the word, see the use of it, the use of it, you will have your ex senses exercised to discern good and evil. And that's going to put you in a whole new place and dimension of being able to properly deal with your adversary, the devil. Huh? They put a blindfold on little Anna the other day to do like, you know, the pin the tail on the donkey. And that's all she talks about. She went into shock. Blindfold. Not good. <laughs> She's like, why is this supposed to be fun? I can't see nothing. And she's just devastated. She's just like devastated. She wakes up in the middle of the night, blindfold. <laughs> she's going to try to sing me happy birthday the other morning. And she's going blind, blindfold. <laughs> it's tough to have a blindfold on and you're in the ba battle and you've got a blindfold on and you're just getting pul you know, pulverated, you know, just... Smacked upside the head because you don't know where it's coming from. Bang, pulverized, bam, throw in the back, from the front, every area. You, you got a blindfold off. I would like, can I take your blindfold off of you? We'd like to take that blindfold off of you. Would you let us take that blindfold off of you? We'd like to take that blindfold off of you. So you can see what's coming at you. Because you can't duck, man, when you, you can't see it coming at you. You can't, you can't stop. The devices of the enemy, when he's been willing, when you've been willing, rather, to allow him to do his deceptive work against you. Mm -hmm. Just get right. I mean, can I make it real simple for you? Make it real simple for you. Get right over here into loving Jesus. To where you love him so much, there ain't nothing more important to you than him. Holy Ghost going to get right in the big middle of that. And then that love will be expressed because it don't matter what happens. It don't matter who's going, what bad thing's going on. It doesn't mess with you because it's all inferior to your love to Jesus. It just kind of, it's all subordinate to your love for Jesus. It can never dominate you. In other words, we say, Lord, be exalted. We're saying, Lord, be exalted in my life above all the other things that I would otherwise exalt because I might exalt my husband or I might exalt my wife or I might exalt my job or I might, I might exalt, exalt my own you know, uh, ideas of what I should do and in, in being successful and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, then that's going to impact the way I worship on Sunday morning and Sunday night. When I stand in the congregation, I'm standing, you're standing in a different place. You need to understand that you're treading upon the holy ground when you come into the church. You're going to have to, you're going to have to be willing, to, you have to be willing to change. Some of you just need to be healed. There are many people that need to be healed. For many people who suffer from various different degrees of depression and anxiety 
and other things that this, uh, you know, modern day environment imposes upon people will get you healed. And you can get healed, just stick your hands up in there and just start worshiping God, you'll get healed quickly. Amen. Amen. Nobody has to lay hands on you. Father, I pray tonight in the name of Jesus, there's enough people in this place to change this whole of this region. Yes. Father, if everybody here is sounding my voice tonight, would just listen and hearken to the voice, O oh God, which you spoke in a word which cannot fade away or pass away, but will abide forever. Yes. Father, we know tonight that everything will begin to change, that your people will take a hold of how wonderful it is to live in your presence, how wonderful it is to love you above all other things, how wonderful it is to worship you, how wonderful it is to receive from you, how wonderful it is to walk with you, Holy Spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. And all these things called abundant life. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that each person would allow you, Holy Spirit, to rule them, that everyone will have it clearly defined in their mind what it looks like and what it means for you to be ruling them, the beauty of their demeanor, the beauty of their attitude, the beauty of their interaction, the pleasantness of their nature, the kindness of their behavior will rule over you so that everything that they do in their conduct in their life will have the sweet aroma of your divine presence. In Jesus' name, amen.